Welcome to a new episode of Full Stack Cast. In this podcast, we're going to take a closer look at the humans behind Full Stack Fest, our ever growing roster of amazing speakers. Their talks inspire us by widening our perspective and deepening our knowledge. But behind each one's well known technical expertise, there is an often lesser known, well rounded human with a wide range of interests and a unique life path. Fullstack Fest is an inspiring conference about software. It's happening on the first week of September in Barcelona, and it's organized by CodeGround, who also produces podcasts. I'm your host, Chus, and today's guests are Lynn Clark and Till Schneiderwald. Lynn is a principal research engineer at Mozilla and recently wrote a big announcement about WASI, a system interface to run WebAssembly outside the browser. Till, aside from doing research engineering at Mozilla, is also working on standards, both for the TC39 and the WebAssembly community group. Yeah, thank you so much for making it for the podcast. I'm really excited about the new developments in WebAssembly and stuff. And I, I thought it was definitely do a talk with uh, Lynn and, and you as well, Till, to see what's up. Basically, because most of this stuff is quite uh, obscure to most developers. It just sounds like, what? They're just making kind of a new thing under the web and they're going to take away all my servers? <laughs> what's what's that? So I think maybe we should start uh, talking a little bit about what WebAssembly is for the members of our audience who don't know. Sure. So uh, WebAssembly is a way of running programming languages besides JavaScript outside or in the web. So before WebAssembly, if you wanted to do things like run a calculation on a web page or change something in response to an event, the only thing that you could do was use JavaScript. But now you can use other languages like Rust or C or C++, compile them to WebAssembly, and have those run on your web page as well. I think uh, one of the first uh, developments in that area was Mscripten, right? That was the first thing I heard about in that kind of space. Right. Kind of compiling C to, to JavaScript. Right. So uh, Mscripten started out by with this idea that you could compile C or C++ to JavaScript. Uh, but that JavaScript didn't run very fast. It was, I think, something like 10 times slower than if you were, you know, running it natively. So there was another engineer uh, here at Firefox who had this insight that you could actually add a little bit of um, type information into the JavaScript and make it possible for the JavaScript engine then to use that information to figure out how to optimize the code so that it ran much, much faster and with predictable performance. And so that brought us Asm.js, which was a subset of JavaScript. Yeah, I remember that. And so we managed to convince other browsers to also implement the same optimizations after we showed how fast things could run using Asm.js. Uh, and that's what led to WebAssembly. You know, we had this partnership, you know, this collaboration with other browsers and, and started talking about how could we take this further? Um, how can we actually bring even more performance to these use cases? Uh, and we wouldn't be able to do it in JavaScript itself. So we need to create another compiler target that other languages could compile to, to get that additional performance. I'm sure that's a thought that's crossed the minds of many developers. Like, what what if we had a real kind of compilation target instead of just like whatever JavaScript version runs on a browser? But I guess it takes a lot to actually convince uh, browser vendors and kind of bring everyone together. How how did it work? Because I know that Mozilla is really behind it, but I don't know about the other vendors if it took a, a really huge effort to convince them. So... One thing that's uh, really important about WebAssembly and also I think kind of special is how much of a collaborative effort it was from the beginning and still is. So you're right that Mozilla is a driving force behind it, but not the only driving force. And in fact, the other major browser vendors have been involved in this from the beginning. So there were conversations about creating this new format well before the public announcement of WebAssembly in 2015. And um, back then, already all the uh, representatives of all the four browser vendors were involved and were signed up. That's really cool. I didn't know that. I, I thought it was, you know, because these things, usually it, it takes like one kind of someone spearheading the whole thing and convincing everyone else. But it's good that uh, the need was there and everyone recognized it and they said, let's do, let's do something about it. 
together. So I guess then one of the main advantages for like, let's say for a JavaScript developer, they would think WebAssembly code is able to run faster than plain JavaScript, right? That's what they would think. Is that an advantage that you would count? So I think that there are two major advantages for WebAssembly. And there's actually now becoming a bit of a third advantage when you're talking about running WebAssembly outside of the browser. I'll talk about that one later. But when you talk about um, running WebAssembly in the browser, the two main advantages are um, if you want to have uh, high performance and predictable performance, WebAssembly can give you that in a way that's hard to get with JavaScript. Uh, somebody on the team rewrote the source maps library and that was in JavaScript, rewrote it in Rust compiled to WebAssembly, and it's 11 times faster, uh, the parser for the source maps library. You could potentially get some of that benefit by high, you know, being very, very, um, ha having these high performance hacks kind of in your JavaScript code, but then it makes your code unmaintainable and unreadable. Um, so it gives you this performance without having to resort to unidiomatic uh, programming styles. Um, in addition to that, let's say you have a code base that's already in Rust or C or C++, and you want to reuse it across multiple different platforms, or even just reuse it for your web app without having to rewrite it. That would be another advantage, is that you can just take this existing code base and run it on the web. Um, now, I mentioned this third reason to use WebAssembly, and this is specifically outside of the browser. Um, WebAssembly can be a lot more secure. It can be easier to sandbox than native code, but it can run at near native performance. Mm -hmm. uh, in the browser, you have this sandbox already because that's part of what the browser gives you. But most code that's running on machines directly, so even say Node.js, doesn't make use of a sandbox. And that means that the code that's running in Node has access to your files and all of these things that it shouldn't have access to. Um, when you're running code with WebAssembly, and particularly um, with this new standardized WebAssembly system interface that we're working on called WASI, mm -hmm. then you have um, more secure execution of code. That's quite mind-blowing, actually, because it kind of challenges the whole, if you're you know, the user of a process, it's kind of, that's the granularity you get mm -hmm. for security. And that's really, that has the potential to uh, change quite a few things in the world of ops and like the way we build things. I'm sure it will take a lot of convincing because <laughs> there's a lot, developers are really stubborn, but <laughs> yeah, that's a really exciting uh, case. Actually, now that you mentioned uh, Rust, it seems that these languages have a particular good fit for WebAssembly, like Rust, uh, C and C++. Um, also, I guess, because they don't have like a big complicated like garbage collectors or any kind of uh, crazy thing. They're just like memory and then you access that memory and that's it. Do you think that's kind of a limitation that uh, some languages that are a little bit more complicated, like garbage collectors and all these moving parts, um, do you think they will eventually be targeting WebAssembly as well? Well, some of them already do. Go and C Sharp or really all languages running in the uh, .NET mm -hmm. uh, runtime virtual machine already do work in WebAssembly and quite a few others. The way Go and .NET work in WebAssembly is very different. I'll focus on Go for now. Mm -hmm. What they have to do is compile the garbage collector to WebAssembly as well and run it as any other WebAssembly code in the linear memory heap that WebAssembly gives you. And that's a bit less straightforward than what, what, what languages like Rust, C, C++ do, as you mentioned. But if you think about it, a Go application that it compiles all the parts in that are needed, that is compiled into a static binary, um, really contains all the same parts. You have to compile Go's garbage collector into that as well. So at, for outside the browser use cases, it doesn't actually make that much of a difference. It leads to larger binaries, but that is because Go is a language that has a larger runtime environment that's needed to execute any code, and you have to have that. In the browser, it's a bit different because in the browser, these languages have their own garbage collector, which is not the same as the browser's garbage collector. And these two don't interact all that well um, or really at all if you don't do manual things to, to sort of wire things up between JavaScript on the one hand and the, uh, the, the Go garbage collector in this case 
running in WebAssembly on the other hand. Mm -hmm. Do you see any kind of major efforts in standardizing that that barrier? Because I, I know that for ClojureScript, it would be a pretty big deal. They were talking about, oh, yeah, it would be great if, you know, you can talk to the kind of JavaScript world in the same kind of object world. Uh, yeah, I'm very glad that you mentioned ClojureScript um, because, uh, yes, there is a standardization effort underway to add GC support to WebAssembly, but it won't be usable for some languages, for example, for Go, because Go's garbage collector is very sophisticated in ways that are just distinct from what we can standardize. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing we, uh, we are working on standardizing is to make it possible to use GC objects from the host environment, so in the browser or from the JavaScript engine, mm -hmm. inside of WebAssembly and operate on them efficiently and be able to pass them around, keep references to them, all while not having to do your own memory management. That, that the host environment gives you all of that. And languages like ClojureScript can use this because ClojureScript um, actually already compiles to JavaScript nowadays. That means it targets this exact garbage collector already. And now by adding support for this garbage collector to WebAssembly, we can allow ClojureScript to, com to target WebAssembly which can lead to more efficient code while still retaining the use of this same garbage collector. And uh, aside from the technical side of things that um, might be really interesting to people who are looking to develop, maybe even uh, port a specific language uh, platform to WebAssembly or as a, as a target, um, for like a more like normal developers, um, what do you think are some realistic use cases that they might be really interested in, in targeting WebAssembly instead of just JavaScript or... I think that there could be um, a lot of, if you're thinking about, you know, a small modules kind of web app where you have lots of um, small modules that do one thing well, uh, you could look at certain parts in that application that could be optimized and just have those rewritten in something like Rust. So, for example, like I mentioned, the source maps library, the parser was rewritten in Rust compiled to WebAssembly. Um, so I think that uh, you'll have a lot of cases like that where most of the application still stays in JavaScript, but this part that does a lot of heavy processing is rewritten in WebAssembly. Um, but I also think that a lot of web developers are going to be able to benefit from WebAssembly without actually ever having to do any Rust, you know, any coding outside of JavaScript themselves. For example, um, we've talked with different frameworks about rewriting things like the virtual DOM library using Rust compiled to WebAssembly. And then all of the users of a framework like React would be benefiting from that work without actually having to write anything in WebAssembly or Rust compiled to WebAssembly themselves. That's nice. Yeah, I guess that's a, that's a really big win for um, most people. Actually, I wanted to ask if you see any kind of uh, big frameworks in the, in the big framework space, like converting code to WebAssembly. But yeah, you, you say already some of them are, are already doing that. That's great. Well, so um, uh, the React team actually has done some experimentation. They haven't actually pushed anything. Um, in, you know, they don't actually have any releases that have WebAssembly in it. But um, all of the frameworks have been exploring this, um, or not all, but most of the frameworks. Um, we actually also have a really uh, neat proof of concept called Dodrio, which actually shows what a virtual DOM algorithm written in Rust using some pretty sophisticated uh, memory allocation techniques can do, and it benchmarks really well. Um, you know, it, so we actually ha don't just think this is possible. We know it's possible to write a fast, efficient virtual DOM uh, diffing algorithm using Rust to WebAssembly. That's cool. Actually, now that you mentioned that, um is it possible? How how's the? Is it possible to write multi-threaded programs and compile them to WebAssembly, or are they constrained to a single thread? So um, that's slightly complicated at the moment. Um, there is support for threading, but one of the key components of that shared array buffer had to be turned off in browsers because of the Spectre security bug in. Uh, chips that happened last year. We're working on mitigations. All of the browsers are working on mitigations for this, and we expect them to be turned on again uh, soon. But um, having to turn that off kind of slowed down the work on, on getting threading support 
across all of the different browsers. Okay, but at least it's kind of it's um, kind of in the in the roadmap because I I played a little bit with Rust and WebAssembly and there was always a thing. Oh, see, if your program runs in a single thread, no problem. It's probably going to work in WebAssembly. I'm like, no, why? <laughs> but I guess it's just a matter of time. So uh, one of our team uh, members, Alex Gretton, actually published a very detailed blog post about what this could look like and what the performance uh, benefits of it are on the hex.mozilla.org blog, um, I think late last year. I think you're right. Yeah. Uh, he uses an example of a uh, weight tracer written in Rust, and he actually took one sort of off the shelf from the weights.io package repository and took it, compiled to, to WebAssembly with either no or very few changes needed, and um, then spent some time on making it multi-threaded because this, there is no ready-made toolchain yet for that. There's, the, the, there's still work to do to make it really just a plug-and-play solution. But the results are very promising, and once browsers all we enable this, we will see massive benefits from having multi-threading in WebAssembly applications. Yeah, because right now it's a little bit limiting in, in the JavaScript world. Definitely you're uh, contained with a single thread. You have some servers, workers and stuff, but it feels like just a straight jacket. Also, um, I think the browser is really interesting and there will be massive benefits, but I think this announcement about kind of the uses of, of uh, WebAssembly in the backend are a lot more like it's easy to to understand that some something will run in the browser. It's just a new virtual machine or new platform. Yeah. What what are the implications of running WebAssembly in the backend? One good way to think about this is what we've been seeing over the last decade is the rise of containers of um, for Docker, then later Kubernetes as a way to manage the uh, sort of fleets of Docker containers. And what is behind this is a need to run code that uh, you want to isolate across all kinds of different uh, devices, platforms, hardware, uh, server architectures. And with the WASI announcement that we um, put out three weeks ago, we are aiming for serving the same kinds of isolation needs. That There are a lot of use cases where you need to run code that you don't fully trust. And that can mean because you didn't review every single line of it and fully understood it, might be a library you're using and you want to just not fully trust it, but you want it to do its job. So you can run it in a sandbox in your application, just feed data in, get a result out, but not give it access to your entire heap, which um, is what you would do nowadays. The only alternative would be to run it in its own process. But if you do that for every lab where you are using, that gets too heavy real fast. Then there are also different and in some ways more extreme use cases, like the Fastly CDN have this platform where they are able to run user or, or customer provided code on every single incoming request. So a, a request taking microseconds really or dozens of microseconds to answer um, and normally with containers you um, or even VMs like a Node.js um, instance you you have to keep an instance running for a while because the start, uh, creating it fresh for every incoming request would be too expensive mm -hmm. but that's not what fast they want to do they want to be able to serve stateless uh, uh, responses to incoming requests from any of their servers in in their CDN and built on WebAssembly they got to an architecture where they can run this code that they again fundamentally do not trust in just a few microseconds or a few dozens of microseconds startup time then answer the request and then, um, tear down the instance of WebAssembly that uh, was used to, to answer that request. And that allows them to run tens of thousands of these instances on a single machine, even in a single process, which is something that really is unprecedented. Yeah, it is. I do remember a few years ago, there was this uh, craze about unikernels and they, some of them tried to fulfill the same kind of thing, right? Like, oh, you just, well, first there's the isolation uh, concern, right? It's like you reduce the attack surface by just basically trimming it down to nothing, the operating system. And then they're really 
uh, quick to start up and, and tear down. But do you think they kind of failed to fulfill the promise and kind of WebAssembly has, has proven, I mean, with Fastly, uh, Jesus Christ, I mean, it's a real, <laughs> it's a really big platform and, and they're using it, right? And I, I have to confess that I'm not an expert on unikernels, but my understanding is that the, the way you trim them down is by taking away all the things you don't need for your specific use case. So it's it's sort of the opposite of a universal runtime. Oh, yeah. And you still run them in, in un, under a hypervisor where you still have some fundamental overhead. My understanding is still fundamentally larger than a single process. Again, if my understanding of how unikernels work is correct enough for, for our purposes here, then in some ways it's almost the opposite uh, approach. We are working on something that is in process that has fundamentally much smaller overhead than a single process even, and that is more universal, where you can run the same code um, in different implementations of the same uh, runtime that is meant to be universal instead of every use case specific. Actually, uh, there's a question that just popped in my mind. It's if it's maybe a bit silly, but I wonder if if there would be like people compiling JavaScript to WebAssembly and running it in the browser instead of directly <laughs> running JavaScript. The engines are really well optimized for running JavaScript, and you know JavaScript is a dynamically typed language. If you want to compile to WebAssembly, at least. You know, for now, you definitely need to have static types. I think that there have been people that have talked about how you could do some kind of dynamic typing. I guess Till could fill us in more on that because I haven't been paying attention to that. So long term, there might be something here. It might be interesting, even if you ignore performance, because you could reduce the amount of engine code that you need to trust and that could potentially have security relevant bugs in it if you could implement large parts of a JavaScript engine uh, in WebAssembly instead of in natively running C++ code, then that could potentially help significantly with security. But for now, as Lynn said, you, you need to compile all WebAssembly code ahead of time instead of doing just in-time compilation and instead of being able to observe the uh, program as it is running and being able to recompile parts of it as you see how it is behaving, which JavaScript engines do. Um, people often ask us whether it would be faster to compile JavaScript to WebAssembly because WebAssembly is faster than JavaScript for many use cases. Um, and so wouldn't it make sense to compile JavaScript to WebAssembly? And one good way, I think, to think about it is if there were optimizations we could do in the process of compiling WebAssembly to uh, sorry, JavaScript to WebAssembly and make it faster, engine implementers for JavaScript engines would use those same optimizations to make the JavaScript faster in their engines. Mm -hmm. So there's really fundamentally nothing that we could do to make it really faster in WebAssembly. But potentially, we could make it fast enough and have the security benefits. Yeah, so mostly it's about reducing the, the amount of um, unsandbox code that is running so that you can... That's a, that's a really noble goal anyway. And actually, in that, in that sense, I can think of uh, a, lot, a lot of applications in the desktop. They have the same problem, right? You trust them with your entire machine. And that is not something that, I mean, people are used to it, but I don't think it's a thing that, that we should be doing in the future. Do you think WebAssembly for desktop applications makes sense? Definitely. Um, and that is actually something that WASI, the WebAssembly standard uh, system interface, uh, opens up is all kinds of use cases where you want to run things directly on the device and not in a browser. And so I think that we could see this through runtimes like, you know, if you think of a runtime like Node, but that has support for WASM instead, we actually have our own version of that web, that kind of runtime called WASM time. And with that, you'll be able to run, you know, apps on regular desktop machines, but it would also scale up to, you know, things where you're running, such as the Fastly use case, where you're running a whole bunch of code in a data center or down to devices like uh, little Internet of Things wearable kind of devices. And so for those, you know, all of those devices, you actually do want to have the ability to run untrusted code, but um, you want to be able to run that untrusted code 
uh, as fast as you can, you know, but as securely as you can at the same time. Interesting. Um, so about the sandbox, uh, though, if I understand correctly, you can spin up a process and then you can have multiple WebAssembly sandboxes. Is that is that the case? Yes. Within a single process? Mm -hmm. So I wonder about resource quotas. Is there a way to say this sandbox can only take this much memory just because one, one, pro one sandbox could take over the entire machine's memory or well, process allow kind of memory? That's a really good question. Uh, the answer is definitely yes. In some ways, that's easier to achieve than, or I guess you can, of course, do that with processes at, as well. But within a process, you need to have something, sort of a clearly defined part of your application where you say you get to use this and this much. And WebAssembly provides you with exactly that. Um, the way you run these individual sandboxes in a single process is by giving them each their own sort of subheap the the linear memory um, that each instance has mm. and growing this linear memory is an operation that the host has to support so it's possible you can uh, um, a WebAssembly application can say give me more memory than i have right now but the host can always say no mm -hmm. um, i don't know off the top of my head whether that is an operation that is fallible, so where the application can handle that, or whether that means at that point your instance just cannot usefully continue working. Um, but at the very least, you can always guarantee an instance can only use as much in the way of resources as you want to provide it. The same is true for uh, CPU usage, by the way. We, um, some aspects of how control flow works in WebAssembly make it quite a bit easier to Im implement checks where if you have an infinite loop, for example, in um, one of these instances, you can tear down the instance but not stop the entire process. And you can also in implement quotas on CPU usage. That's, that's perfect. It sounds like a, an extremely in-process, lightweight kind of process management, but you get all the benefits. It's kind of, it sounds like magic, honestly. Like if you, if you were to sell it to me, I'm like, I don't know. That sounds like snake oil, but yeah, it, it's, I guess it's a thing. Wow. There's even um, <laughs> one additional piece to exactly this. Um, for use cases that do, where you have multiple instances that have to talk to each other, think the Unix pipeline model, where you have multiple individual applications doing one job well, and you get some larger piece of functionality by turning, by, by, by piping the result of one of them into another one to create a new, more refined result. Um, in um, if you have all these applications as individual processes, then you have a lot of overhead for the communication between these processes because that all has to go through syscalls and syscalls have pretty much, uh, a pretty high overhead. With um, if you have them instead as multiple WebAssembly instances running in the same process, you can have all of this as content code running in a process without the intervening syscalls to communicate between processes. So there are real world use cases where um, you can have these kinds of complex pipelines be faster than as you, if they were individual applications. Interesting. And internally, does that work by sharing just a little part of the memory? Um, how to exactly express this in a way where compilers can easily make use of it is actually something we have to figure out in the standardization process for WASI. Mm -hmm. But what you just said, that that's a good starting point for how to think about it. Cool. And uh, what about, of course, we've talked about desktop and browsers and backends, and I guess mobile is like the obvious like, what implications do you think are for mobile, like, if they were to support WebAssembly natively? So I'm not sure that the implications for mobile are that much different than they are for the other kinds of devices that we've been talking about. Mm. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, a mobile phone, you're talking about something that's somewhat more resource constrained. And so the, the same kinds of things that I was talking about with IoT would apply there. Mm. Um, 
being able to have this kind of runtime that has a, a very low footprint uh, and that can make um, efficient use of resources uh, would really help with you know mobile development too. And it would mean that you can have code that's targeting um, the web and mobile devices um, without having to have you know a react react native kind of solution. Yeah, that makes sense. I guess yeah, being able to target multiple different mobile platforms with the same uh, code would be an advantage. And that is really true not only for mobile platforms as in iOS and Android, but also for IoT devices, where you um, currently have all these highly bespoke uh, tool chains for targeting different IoT devices. And if you want to compile to multiple of them, you have to compile multiple of these tool chains and they are all have, have their intricacies that you have to figure out and how does debugging work and what are exactly the interfaces to, uh, to, to use here. And by targeting WASI and WebAssembly instead, if there is an implementation of the runtime for multiple devices that you want to target, then depending on your use case, of course, um, it might be possible to really only compile things once and have it uh, have them run on all of these devices. Or at least um, if they are too different in their core functionality, it still might allow you to use exactly the same tool chain, the same developer tools, the same debugger, IDE, and all of that without any extra setup, without installing these multiple bespoke tool chains. And when it comes to um, to security, because this is software still, WebAssembly, and, uh, you know, being everyone, you know, with the standardization, everyone needs to uh, come up with their own implementation for their browsers and stuff. How do you see the, do you think there's a lot of oversight in terms of security to make sure that there's no, because a hole in like, WebAssembly would mean that servers, mobile phones, desktop apps, everything is compromised. Yes, that is true. <laughs> um, and you're absolutely right. If things develop in the way we, we are talking about, then WebAssembly runtimes will become sort of mission-critical parts of platforms and will require the commensurate attention to their security. One good thing is WebAssembly as, so the WebAssembly sandbox model is tiny. Um, the, the formal specification for WebAssembly's runtime uh, semantics fits on less than a single page, oh, wow. which compared to uh, other languages is a, a factor of hundreds smaller. That is really only the the WebAssembly core semantics, uh, sort of the the, the instruction set. Um, it's still it, it's I think a big achievement, and actually the, there is a full formal definition of the semantics, which also is pretty unique. Then for all the interfaces, we are talking about standardizing for WASI. We also need to have a solid understanding of what the security implications are, and how to implement them securely. I think we have two advantages here. One is we are not starting from scratch with a new security model that nobody else has ever thought of. Instead, we are building on um, a capabilities-based security where really the, the, the core approach is fairly easy to understand. It's essentially you're not asking for something, um, please give me... Um, something based or access to a file, for example, based on a string. Um, and then you have security checks in place for checking, is the code asking for it allowed to get access to this? Instead, the core idea is if you have the ability to ask for something, so if, if you sort of have the vocabulary even to, to, to talk about the exact thing you're asking for, then you're allowed to get it. So for example, in, uh, if, if you can talk about objects in a language like Java or JavaScript, if you don't have access, say, say in JavaScript, if you don't have access to a specific object, you can't call methods on it. There's no way for you to do it. And that is actually really object capabilities in a nutshell. 
And you need to be very clear and very careful about not being able to accidentally give things access to these objects. But it's much easier to reason about than adding lots of filters carefully for not accidentally letting things slip. And the other part is that for our implementation, at least, we are using Rust. It's not a panacea. It's not like you can't write insecure code in Rust. You very much can. But there is a whole range of uh, security issues that are very common, that are, at the very least, much less likely, in some cases, almost flat out impossible in Rust compared to C++, which would sort of be the other large options for doing this. That makes sense. So what you mentioned about the security model being kind of object capabilities based or something like that. Um, do you think, so for example, if, I, if you give me the capability to read files, you will give it to me scoped to a specific directory or something like that? Correct, yes. So if I ask you about a file, it's always in the context of that directory. Mm -hmm. I cannot go you know, and read uh, etc password, the classic. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, um, that's so cool. I have another silly question <laughs> that just popped in my mind. Like, do, would it make any sense to to design a hardware architecture that could run WebAssembly natively? Well, uh, a lot of chips do have special instructions for uh, making things like JavaScript more performant, uh, and you could see, um, you know, chips adding those kinds of instructions, or you know, a, a chip that is designed to run it natively. I don't know, Till, have you had any conversations around this? I have had conversations around it. It's just being able to execute web, the, the WebAssembly opcodes um, that, that make the, uh, up the WebAssembly instruction set wouldn't in itself necessarily be enough because to have the security properties for WebAssembly, you really want to verify the WebAssembly code beforehand. And that is what all WebAssembly uh, compilers do before they um, execute anything. They con take the WebAssembly code, compile it to native um, uh, code for, for the current CPU. And while doing so, they verify that everything is in order, that there are no, um, no jumps in there to invalid addresses and um, a, a bunch of other things. And you really want to do this whole program verification before executing anything. So just being able to feed some WebAssembly code to a CPU without being able to do the whole program verification uh, first, that would probably not be desirable. You could conceive of something where you upload the entire WebAssembly module into something like a trusted zone in the um, computer architecture. And then that does verification, checks that everything is OK, and then directly executes it. Whether that is better than converting it on the fly into native code or not, I think only time will tell. Yeah, so I think I've run kind of out of questions, but I'm sure you have uh, probably something you've been working on recently or like something you have in mind, maybe if you want to share about WebAssembly. Well, what we've really been focusing on recently is WASM time, which is our implementation of WASI. And um, we will have a post coming out about that soon. So people should stay tuned to learn more about what we're doing there. Awesome. Yeah. I, th I think I have to share some links as well in the podcast notes because a lot of these things that we've discussed are probably new to to quite a lot of people. Definitely have to thank you for taking the time for doing this. And it's been really interesting. And for me, especially that I'm really motivated with WebAssembly and with Rust. Um, oh, maybe I have one last question, actually, because I see that Rust has taken kind of a primary um, kind of primary role or primary space in this kind of whole discussion. It seems that Rust is like the way to write WebAssembly. Or uh, Do you think Rust is also kind of gaining popularity because of WebAssembly or the other way around? They really are working very well together. Um, Rust really is making systems programming much more accessible to people. And so it really is, I think, a really great language to bring into the web space where there are so many people who are self-educated and um, working on really cool things, but don't have that systems programming background. I think that the, uh, you know, um, 
between Rust and WebAssembly, they both um, give you a bit more of a secure way to do things so that you aren't putting yourself as much at risk without having that uh, systems programming background. So I think that they're great complements for each other. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. I, in my experience, it's a little bit of a gateway drug to systems programming because it's a pretty safe one as, as well mm -hmm. <laughs> because you you won't get anything running. Like you will be fighting with a compiler for most of the week and then maybe on Friday <laughs> it compiles. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Just that you, uh, so in C++, just that you have something compiling doesn't mean that you should ever run that code outside of your development environment. Yes. With Rust, when you have it compiling, it's not it's, it's probably harder to get it to compile. That is true. But once you do have it compiling, you can actually be fairly sure in thinking, okay, this, this is free of some of the worst security issues that normally have uh, occur in systems programming. Yeah, that's been my experience as well. I'm, I'm pretty excited for the kind of this growth, both from Rust and WebAssembly. So yeah, I'll definitely stay tuned on that one. And uh, yeah, and I guess then I'll meet you in person in, in September, Lynn, and yes. for Sackfest. And I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you. I'm looking forward to meeting you. I'll probably know a bunch of WebAssembly by then. Maybe I have some toy project or something I'll show. <laughs> Excellent. And I'll see you in September. Thanks. Thanks for having us on. And I'll yes, see you thank then. You. And to our listeners, I hope you've all enjoyed this episode. If you want to see Lynn on stage and many other great speakers, you can go to fullstackfest.com. Until next time, and see you all in September. <laughs> <laughs>